everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I thought we would talk about the relevant planning policies that I would use in support of a brownfield application on a residential development site. So what I mean by this is a site that currently has a existing use, it might be commercial, agricultural, something like that, and the proposal is to knock down the existing massing and replace it with a residential development. So what very specific planning policies would I use, use from both a local plan level and the national planning policy level in order to support this redevelopment? Now, beyond the policies I will discuss in this video, they're sort of generic policies that you will bring in in support of any application. So you'll often find there are policies around like green infrastructure, uh, sustainable design, um, highways, um, clean water strategies, flooding strategies, um, being built in line with building regs, you know, all these are sort of generic for any type of residential site. And perhaps I can do a video in the future where I talk through what these are as well. But the main policies I wanna focus on today are those that support the redevelopment of brownfield sites specifically, because these seems to be one um, ones that people struggle with quite a lot. So for context, I have worked within Coventry City Council because as I mentioned, we're gonna be looking at a local and a national level, which means I need to be looking at Coventry City Council's adopted local plan, as well as the National Planning Policy Framework or the MPPF. So I'm gonna flash up on the screen a few examples of the type of site we would have in question. I was gonna bring up one specific site, find one and then bring it up, but I didn't want uh, everyone approaching a random landowner who did not ask for their site to be discussed on a YouTube video. But essentially we're looking Looking for something that has some older disused um, commercial type buildings they don't necessarily have to have the use class in planning terms to go alongside it um, but they are going to be you know on the end of their life cycle that we're looking to redevelop and they're gonna need to have a substantial amount of massing in place so if it's just say two stables it's probably not going to be enough as you'll see from these pictures they have um, substantial massing behind them so assuming we have one of these sites on an agreed option we've done pro map drawings on it we've had our architects get involved we've made our offer done our appraisals all of that we're now saying right let's take it to planning what are the main planning policies that i would look to put into my planning statement when bringing this site to planning. So first of all, I just wanna talk about the difference between our local and national policies. So local policies, when I reference these, these are policies that have been adopted within the local plan for that local authority. Now, the adoption of these policies should be done in line with national planning policy framework. So they do interlink closely, but it gives a more localized view on uh, planning and importantly, the priorities for that local authority. National planning policy framework is obviously the policies that the whole country has to abide by. And it's a combination of both of these that we will put forward in our planning statement, hopefully to put forward a very convincing argument to planning to get as an approval. So first of all, I wanna look at a national level. So these are all policies pulled out of the NPPF, National Planning Policy Framework. So policy eight within the NPPF sets out three overarching objectives within planning in order to achieve sustainable development. Now this is developments that support the economic growth of a local area, has a good social impact on the local area as well as an environmental impact. So these are slightly more generic in their approach and not necessarily focused on just uh, brownfield sites, but they are very focused around residential development, or they can be focused around residential development. So that would be one of my leading policies that I go in with on my planning statement, is highlighting the need and ultimately then going on to talk about how my site, um, or my proposal I should say, closely supports these objectives. I'd also be bringing in the overarching planning policy of presumption in favor of sustainable development, and I'll bring up the policy on the screen, but this goes on to talk about how decision-making should be done and how decisions should be made. And I think this is what an important one um, to bring in because in essence, what it's saying is planners, decision-makers should be approaching the process of development from a positive standpoint, a proactive standpoint, and the standpoint of trying to find an approval, not necessarily trying to find a refusal. 
And I think just reminding them of that can be quite important. Paragraph 59 in the MPPF sets out the government's objective to substantially boost the supply of housing as well as having a wide variety of housing in the market. Again, it's a generic policy, but it's very important when we're talking about the redevelopment of any site into residential. Paragraph 68 is another one I'd bring in, and this stresses the importance of small to medium size developments in the planning process and delivery process. And I think particularly for developers of you know my size and a lot of people's sizes who aren't you know, your big PLC house builders, this policy is very relevant because you are the people that are supplying these types of sites into the market. And I think highlighting the fact that there is a need for sites of five houses, 10 houses, 20 houses, not just big allocations for 100, 200 houses at a time is very important for the health of a general housing market. Paragraph 117 requires decision-making to promote the effective use of land to meet the housing need. Now, I think this is an important one because this is when we first start to get into the type of land or the use of the land and, or previously used land. Now, as we're bringing forward a brownfield site, any policies that relate to, you know, the effective use of previously used land or the effective regeneration and repurposing of land is very important in our conversations because that's exactly what we're doing when we're taking a brownfield site through planning for the redevelopment for residential. And then following on from that is paragraph 118, which stresses the importance of using brownfield sites when meeting established needs, particularly housing needs or any other identified needs in the market. So this is almost um, a follow on point from 117, but actually stressing that in brownfield site situations, it's very important that these are used. And then one of the final ones that I would specifically highlight in uh, the situation of brownfield sites is paragraph 145. Now this relates to Greenbelt. The reason this is something maybe to bring forward is a lot of the brownfield sites, at least around where I live in the Midlands, um, also happen to fall within the Greenbelt. And this is very important for the conversation because we need to respect Greenbelt policy as well as Brownfield policy. So in paragraph 145 of the MPPF, paragraph 145 states, a local planning authority should regard the construction of new buildings as inappropriate in the Greenbelt. Exceptions to this are, now there are several exceptions, but the important ones for developers in the Greenbelt are sub E, which is limited infilling in villages, F, limited affordable housing for local community needs, and G, limited infilling or the partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land, whether redundant or in continuing use, excluding temporary buildings, which would not have a greater impact on the openness of the green belt than the existing development, or not cause substantial harm to the openness of the green belt, where the development would reuse previously developed land and contribute to meeting an identified affordable housing need within the area of the local planning authority. Now, this is a really important one when we are dealing with brownfield sites that fall in the green belt. And this is essentially talking about the overall impact that any development is gonna have in the green belt. And the word openness is quite an important one. Uh, and I'll go on um, to talk about what that can mean for brownfield sites later on. They're all of the policies that I specifically would highlight to support a brownfield development from a national level. From a local level, I'm now gonna pull up policies from Coventry City Council's um, adopted local plan and supplementary planning documents. Now, in terms of other authorities, one good recommendation I have, if you don't have a planning consultant on board, is you go into other applications that are similar to the one that you are proposing, go into their documents and find planning statements or design and access statements whereby, whereby they will detail all of the policies that they believe support that application. And in there, you'll be able to find ones that they've pulled. If not, you can also, of course, trawl through all of the local plan documents and things like that in order to find ones that support your application. So again, in the context of general development and specifically brownfield sites in Coventry, the first policy that I would highlight from a local level is DS1. And this is a policy relating to overall development needs. And this policy confirms that a minimum of 24,600 additional homes will be provided between the years 2011 and 2031 by Coventry. The next one is policy DS3, and this is a sustainable development policy that sets out 
the council's approach to sustainable development, including, and the important subsection to this one is D, the creation of mixed sustainable communities through a variety of dwelling types, sizes, tenures, and range of community facilities. Now, the range of community facilities is more linked to sort of commercial developments, but importantly, I'm now starting to bring in the idea of varied types of houses, types of sites, um, because again, a effective and competitive market would not be one that is only made up of PLC house builders. It needs smaller SMEs in the market to create that competition and policies like that I wanna bring forward to highlight uh, the need for sites like the one I'm proposing in this context, let's say it's I'm proposing nine dwellings on a brownfield site are very important for the overall health and um, the meeting the market needs. Another policy that I picked up on in the Coventry Local Plan is policy H1. Now this is very similar to policy DS1 but it doesn't harm to have more than one policy supporting your application and policy H1 confirms that the council will deliver a minimum of 24,600 dwellings between 2011 and 2031. Again, we already knew this, but the fact that this is written in two types of policies within the local plan and supplementary plan documents isn't a negative by any means. It just means you've got one extra tick box in your corner. So policy H4 is another one that I would pick up in the um, Coventry local plan. And this requires residential developments to include a mix of market housing, which contributes towards a balance of house types and sizes across the city in accordance with the latest strategic housing market assessment. So again, this is just drawing on the fact that a competitive and healthy market will have a variety of sites, sellers, and house types to meet all the different needs uh, that that market has. So again, bringing forward that policy is good for particularly smaller developers like ourselves, because we are meeting that smaller supply that the big house builders don't meet. And then importantly, I would bring in the greenback policy because again, um, most likely if it's around Coventry or around a lot of big cities, if you've got a brownfield site out in the countryside, it's not necessarily gonna be open countryside policy, it will be greenback policy. So in Coventry, greenback policy, policy GB1, essentially sets out that they will follow national planning policy in the context of the Green Belt, which is in relation to essentially doing no harm or no increased harm or not negatively affecting the openness of the Green Belt. Now, unfortunately for brownfield sites, and I think this is why a lot of people struggle, particularly when they are in the Green Belt, there is no objective measure for openness. What does openness mean? Now, one thing I would do, we've got all of our policies and I would probably bring forward an additional 20 to 30 policies that are sort of more generic. And these are, as I mentioned before, things like the requirement for suitable drainage strategies, meeting highways needs, um, biodiversity impacts, all these sorts of things are, you know, given on any development site. I've just spoken about some of the quite important ones for brownfield redevelopment, but alongside all of our policies, we also need to start talking about this openness conversation, which is a big one when it comes to a lot of our brownfield sites in the green belt. And personally, how I like to tackle that situation is on a massing basis. So when we have a brownfield site, let's say there is um, 25,000 uh, square feet of footprint of brownfield use buildings, whatever they might be, old agricultural sheds, workshops, could be anything. We have 25,000 square foot and an appropriate volume that goes along with that and ridge heights as well. Ideally, I want to bring forward a development that results in a reduced ridge height, which often isn't that difficult if we have big agricultural buildings because, because commercial buildings tend to be much larger in ridge heights than residential. So this is normally quite achievable. So I wanna propose something that has a reduced ridge height, a reduced square footage and reduced volume. Again, this tends not to be too difficult because when we have very large agricultural sheds, the reality is when we replace these with housing, we then aren't gonna have the exact same footprint for footprint because otherwise we would have a massive either house or a big block of terraced houses. It just would not be good design and good practice. So 
just through the design process, we tend to result in a reduction in massing on our brownfield sites. And that's a really important thing to show. And for me, I would always show my massing calculations on any planning statement. Although this isn't linked to necessarily a planning policy, apart from maybe the openness policy, I think it's a really important thing to show that actually the redevelopment of this site results in a lower impact on that land than leaving it as it is would. Also from an openness perspective, you can look at things like the views through the site, because again, as I mentioned, we're gonna go from let's say several large solid buildings to broken up building that creates views through the site that we previously didn't have, which you could argue creates more openness in that area. Now, some authorities, and I will try and find an example of a policy like this one and pop it on the screen for you now, have policies relating to brownfield massing and brownfield curtilage. Now, what this means is the brownfield massing is a pretty obvious one. It's where where is the, the permanent structures on that site, um, you know, it could be, like I say, pig sheds, it could be workshops, it could be just a storage building. You know, that is the massing. And then we have the curtilage, and this is the land around these buildings. Quite commonly, it's some sort of hard standing that could be used for, again, storage, parking, maneuvering around the site, or in some cases, fields can be associated within the brownfield curtilage if they were used as part of the commercial activity. A very common one where we might see this is something like a dog kennels, for example, where the exercise field, although there's, it's just a field to look at, that field was intrinsic to the commercial activity and therefore it would be included within the brownfield curtilage. What we sometimes have with brownfield policy is, and again, I will show an example of this policy, is a situation where the local authority will say that any redevelopment has to sit, um, their starting position, should we call it, is that any new buildings should sit within the existing footprint of what is there and things like the gardens, roads, general workings of the site shouldn't extend past the curtilage. So buildings where the buildings are and things like gardens not extending past that curtilage area. Now, if the council insist on that and they stick very rigidly to that, you're going to really struggle to maximize the opportunity on this site, simply because as I mentioned, you would never build a row of, uh, you know, 10 terrace houses, let's say, or you would very rarely do that. It'd be, very rarely would that be the most, um, give you the best return on investment on that site. You know, ideally you may have wanted, let's say four bed attached or something. So when we have that situation, you're unfortunately gonna have the worst outcome on that site for lack of a better term. Whereas some councils will say, however, this can be reviewed on, you know, a case by case basis in line with the appropriate design. And if a council's willing to work with you, that's where you can sort of reposition the overall curtilage on the site, reposition where the footprint for footprint is going to be. And that allows you to come up with a much more cohesive design. And when a local authority has adopted a policy like this, that's where you really wanna be weighing in on policies that link to sustainable design, um, better living environments, uh, open spaces, all of these sorts of things, because that's gonna support allowing you to rework the brownfield massing on that site. So I hope you guys found that video useful and it gave you some insight on some of the particular planning policies that I would use to support a brownfield application. If you'd like to know anything more about, about planning policies, uh, the planning policies I would use on any other types of sites or in general, any other videos you wanna see, drop a comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next video.